Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 222, Ray Allen. And Tommy, yes, I am wearing the exact same outfit as I did last week because I'm recording it this week. <laughs> There's going to be three people in the YouTube comments who notice it and say something. So I'm wearing the same just, thing, just guys. To, just, I'm wearing the same thing. Just address it. Uh, my kids have spring break next week, uh, so... I will not be uh, in studio to record anything. So we're just recording the intro and our DraftKings Sportsbook ahead of time. Tommy, I went over to Ray's place down in Miami uh, last week when I was calling the Heat game. First of all, guys got a phenomenal setup. Shout out to Ray, man. You you did it right. You got a phenomenal setup. <laughs> he does it right. Crib. I feel like he yeah. just, like, he, he makes good yes. choices in yes. life. By the way, Ray, Ray still looks like he could play in the NBA. I'm pretty sure he could go out there and uh and get a few buckets uh we talk about a ton of stuff um you know as always whenever we uh interview anybody you 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 kind of go with what the guest wants to talk about and ray is very passionate about a bunch of things and we had a really fun fun conversation uh about the celtics the heat specific shots shooting in general uh youth basketball um, just uh, a great conversation with Ray, just a super smart, articulate, uh, thoughtful guy. And uh, as I told him, and he knows this, and you'll see it 15 fucking different times in the interview. <sighs> I had my favorite players growing up, Tommy. I obviously, I started watching the NBA. I love Duke. That all happened at the same time. And the Bulls were winning. So, of course, I loved Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan, to me in the 90s, was the best player, and he was on the best team. So, of course, I rooted for the Bulls. As Michael Jordan started to get older, and then he retired for the second time, uh, became kind of obsessed with Ray Allen. This was as I was entering high school, and uh, I, I legitimately wanted to be and play like Ray Allen. He was like the guy that I was like, I want to model my game after. I remember there was like a, a scouting report my junior senior year, um, you know, in the in the rankings nationally. It was like you know, here's the top five shooting guards in the country, and I don't don't even remember what number I was ranked. Probably two or three. I think Rashad McCants was the number one guy, but uh, they had a comp for every player, and I remember one of those national rankings lists was like comp Ray Allen, and I was like, fuck yes doing it right now of course i didn't turn out to be ray allen <laughs> but you got you got pretty close you i was, got, a, you I was pretty, a poor man's i was got, a plumber's yeah, approximation pretty, got, of ray you allen pretty, you got pretty close the nice thing is at least when people talk about ray allen you're generally in the conversation at some you your name comes up at you and yeah. kyle like your name comes up yeah. at some point around yeah I, I i i approximated the uh the boston celtics version of ray allen but of course as we we get into it with ray guys got had so much game uh, and and sacrificed a little bit of that game to make Boston uh, work uh, with with Paul Pierce and KG. Um, the other thing about Ray, and I just want to say this before we do our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. The other thing about Ray, Ray was so good to me. He was so good to me. And I, I tell the stories of what that means uh, with Ray, but he was so good to me. He was aware of how I felt about him and how I viewed him. And he was always so good to me. I always appreciate uh, Ray Allen. All right, let's get to our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. We're going to talk about uh, Coach of the Year, something we haven't touched on. On DraftKings Sportsbook right now, Mark Dagnalt is the odds-on favorite to win Coach of the Year. Oklahoma City, of course, has had a fantastic season. He's at minus 310 as of today. Chris Finch, second at plus 450. Joe Missoula, plus 700. And my guy, thank God, he's starting to get some buzz here in the conversation Jamal Mosley, who was an assistant coach on Dallas when I was there, and I only knew Mose for a couple months. Uh, I still talk to him quite frequently. An awesome dude, having a great uh, year as a coach. I, you know, the thing with coaching, and again, this, this goes back to uh, the job security with coaching and the perception of coaching, it's a lot of it is based on expectations, right? A team that exceeds expectations. That is viewed as a good coaching job. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the general thought when we talk about Coach of the Year. I think yeah, that's fair. For sure. For sure. With with, with Moe's in particular, uh, I saw the stat today 
Last time Orlando was 12 games above 500 was March 30th, 2012. Yeah, I was there. Um, you're, yeah. so you, know, you know it well. Yeah. Uh, Magic are fourth in defense, 12th in net. Last year they were 18th in defense, 24th in net. They've obviously been playing great recently. Um, Jeez, just thinking about it, man. That was the lockout year. And I want to say we had like the third or fourth best record in the NBA up to the point when Dwight Howard left the team and he did, we didn't know he was leaving the team. He was literally at shoot around. We were getting ready to play the Hawks. He was at shoot around. We get to the arena and he's not there. And we find out at some point, either right before the game or during the game that he had flown out to LA to get back surgery. His back had been bothering him. We were like the third or fourth, we had and the no third or fourth knew, best record. No, no, we knew he had a back issue. He had he had like sat out a couple practices. Yeah. He had tried playing through it. He tried to tough it out. You could see it in practice. I remember vividly, like I was I, I was taking a rep off, or maybe my team wasn't on or something. But he he tried to go up for a dunk vertically, and I want to say it was against Malik Allen. But he tried to go up for a dunk vertically, and you could just see like he had no lift. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, he's something wrong with someone, something, something wrong with Dwight. And then he, he left, went to LA, did the back surgery, wasn't with the team the rest of the year. And we just fucking cratered and then lost to the Pacers in the first round. Thanks for bringing up that memory. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad to do it. It's amazing that, but it's amazing that stat that this team, you've talked about their drafting and that, you know, yeah. since then everything like that, but it's yeah. amazing. That's that. My question about those four you named, I wanted to bring up one other name after this, but with, I mean, Dagnall and Moe's in particular, like we knew what the Celtics were going to be. This is no shade to Joe Mazzulla. Yeah. You know, we've had Joe Mazzulla on the show. He's been great, but you knew the Celtics were going to be really good going into the season. How much yeah. does that matter for teams like this making the jump versus when you talk about expectations? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I think if the Celtics were, you know, 47 and 20, uh, Joe Mazzulla wouldn't be getting any buzz. The fact is the Celtics are literally having one of the best regular seasons. I saw this point differential the other the other day. They've got like the fifth best point differential in NBA history uh, for, for the regular season. So they're having an all-time regular season. Uh, certainly not the 2016 Warriors. I'm not putting them in that category, but they're having one of the better regular seasons of any team in NBA history. So I think that's why he's, he's still got buzz. There's, there's still obviously the expectation component to this. I think he's done a fantastic job. They've been basically top three uh, in defense and offense all season, super creative, uh, particularly with uh, defensive matchups and how he uses Drew Holiday. Um, he's really leaned into, uh, you know, the curveball as he likes to call it. Where can we exploit matchups? How can we use Porzingis the best way possible that complements our other star players? I got to give Joe Mazzulla a lot of credit. Uh, Dagnalt, uh, in particular, I, I think and Mosley have like exceeded the expectations. Chris Finch to me deserves a lot of credit. And I'll tell you why, because they make that trade for Gobert. And I think everybody thought last year they were going to be awesome. Cat misses a bunch of time. They don't really ever find time to, to meld together. And Mike Conley comes in. He kind of makes the whole thing work. Chris Finch is probably facing a lot of pressure internally yeah. and externally coming into this year and he's built the best defense in the NBA or a top two defense in the NBA. Anthony Edwards has grown as a player. He's figured out how to make the cat and Rudy Gobert thing work. He's given, he's empowered, I would call it empowered Nas Reed. He's gotten Nikhil Alexander Walker to buy in to his role. Just a phenomenal job from Chris Finch. Uh, and, and then with Mose, I, I, I say like, this is another example of exceeding expectations that that team last year was five and 20. They were basically a 500 team the rest of the year. And they just picked up where they left off. There's sometimes these massive, uh, you know, pops and bursts of growth. This feels a, a lot like just in, incremental growth. Franz Wagner, Paulo, obviously taking another step forward. Um, Jonathan Isaac has been tremendous defensively when he's been on the court, Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony buying in, into his role and, and, and they're 40 and 28 and Wendell Carter has missed a ton of time with injury. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all, all four of these coaches have done a, a fantastic job this season, all deserving. Can I throw in one more name before we move on? Yes. JB Bickerstaff. Yeah. Deserves a ton of credit. 
deserve a ton of credit. JB Bickerstaff currently sixth in odds, uh, plus nine thousand. Uh, but JB obviously deserves a Just ton with of credit. The injuries. I mean, oh the, my god, it's, to be where they are, they're one as of taping, they're one game back of the Bucks for the two seed. Yeah. With the amount of time those guys have missed, is pretty crazy. Yeah. He he absolutely deserves a ton of credit. Uh, all right, this has been our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. The NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JJ. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Oh, by the way, we also have a draft with Tim Legler. That draft, of course, presented our, by our friends at New Era. Uh, let's get to our conversation with Ray Allen. You you weren't a McDonald's All-American? No. <laughs> but it, I, I think that that was probably more of a blessing than a curse. And, you know, at, even at the time, it was political uh, because – the, the McDonald's team at the time was in Memphis. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in Memphis. And the coach of the team, you know, had players that he liked that, you know, he put, and they were somewhere always around my ranking in the, in the class that year. You know, whenever we played at different camps, it was always those few guys that were always compared. We were compared to each other. And then when the, when the ranking came out, I was like 25A or 25B. You know, it was always like I was one guy off the roster, but it was the best thing in the world for me because when you look back at uh, McDonald's All-American teams, a lot of names you don't remember, you know, because I think it almost is, it can be a curse for them because those kids think that they already made it, you know, and every year, this year for my team, I wrote all the guys down from last year and I showed them who made it and who didn't you know, uh, what they did in their freshman years and in college and, and how just because you scored as many points in high school, you going to college, you got to start all, all over again. And more importantly, I think I said, congratulations, nobody here made it. That means you're on your way. I love that. I really do. Because I, I think the whole ecosystem around rankings and awards in high school, there's something about the development of a an adolescent's mind where uh too much too soon can be a curse and i think you know jamal crawford talked about the parents at aau games aau tournaments needing basically to look themselves in the mirror like it it, it is a little bit on the parents and it is a little bit on the coaches because the kids are ill-equipped to handle things i i, I t- talk about this all the time the the best players in the NBA, like there's LeBron, obviously chosen at a young age, whatever. A lot of them were second round picks. A lot of them, like Jimmy Butler went the Juco route. Like it, it doesn't have to be this like singular thing where like you have to be a McDonald's All-American. You have to be an All-American in college. Like the journey to get to a long NBA career is so different for everybody. Think about uh, Reed Shepard right now. Yeah, He was like a four-star recruit, not a McDonald's All-American. I saw Kevin O'Connor for the ringer had him in his latest mock draft at number one. as the number one pick if the Spurs get it because of the pairing with Wembenyama. Yeah, and he, he's been playing well. He's had a great year. Um, you know, to, to your point, when, when you look at a lot of AAU teams, uh, and a lot has been said about the formula, like kids are coming from all over to play on these different teams and they're not practicing during the week. Uh, all these kids are looking around and seeing what gear they can get. And a lot of kids don't actually want to practice. You know, they want to go to the formula that they can just show up and play games. And the parents are enabling it. 
and the coaches know that the parents are enabling it. So they're trying to entice every player that they can. And the one thing that I know about, you know, being successful, no matter what you do, where you play and who you are, like if you have a passion for doing this, it comes. Like people, if you go out on the court and you're just out there working hard every day and you're in the playground and you nobody's out there, you keep doing that for a couple of days to, to a week to some weeks, people are going to start showing up and playing because they see you out there every day. It's not about who's not there. It's about you showing up for yourself. And, and Reed Shepard, you know, whatever the rankings say, you, you got to now play all these kids that are reclassing. You still got to play with these same guys when you come to college. So if you want to cheat the high school system and say, I'm a freshman now, but I should be a junior. Okay. You're going to beat up on some kids that were younger than you, but you still got to go to college. And you go to college, it's going to be some grown men waiting on you. And, and you know, looking at Reed Shepard's example, and I got a you know, interesting story. Like, I, I was being recruited by Kentucky at the time, and I was trying to make the, the, the difference between uh, Kentucky and, and um, Connecticut. My first visit was to Alabama, and then it was to Kentucky. And I had Wake Forest and NC State and all these schools, but it narrowed down to just these three. And then when I took my visit during Midnight Madness to Kentucky, it was amazing. And I was like, wow, my head is kind of blown out the water. And then I had committed to Alabama and then I decommitted because I was like, I need to see my other visits first and just have some comparison. Kentucky, I'm walking away like, wow, this place is amazing. And I was like, I love this place too. And then I was learning at a young age, like, just go through the process and understand it and get the information and just try and figure this thing out. And then when I went to Connecticut, it the writing was on the wall for me as to what place was better for me. And that, that was Connecticut after coming back and understanding the environment. And then in the same token, uh, Reed Shepard's dad, Jeff Shepard, uh, signed to go to Kentucky. And I was like, oh, well, okay. Well, that that definitely, you know, and, and I've seen Jeff and I played against Jeff uh, a lot throughout the summer in camps. And, um, you know, it, it just, it, the writing is on the walls. Sometimes your path is laid out for you. And it's not about where you get paid. It's nowadays with NIL or um, you know, how close to home you can be or where your girlfriend goes to school or, you know, all these things are short-term decisions. They they get you for the next year to get you comfortable, but how does that help your long-term success? Like, are you setting yourself up for eight to 20 years down the line because you went somewhere with a great reputation that's going to work you to death and it's going to make you become your better self? Right now, we don't know who we are. At this stage of our lives, are we setting ourselves up to be great later on in life? And it requires going somewhere that they're going to push you. And yes, it's going to be hard, but you got to get comfortable with doing hard. I've always appreciated your uh, perspective and your your mindset. Um, there's a little bit of relatable OCD, I think, between the two of us. Um, did you have that mindset when you were a teenager? And how much did your upbringing sort of guide that mindset? Well, I grew up in the military. So you're traveling, you know, we traveled on average every three years where we got orders to travel. Like we, I was born in uh, Southern Cal or Northern California. And then we moved to Germany and then from Germany to, uh, to Oklahoma, Oklahoma to England, England to Southern California, and then from Southern California to South Carolina. So I learned early that people do so many different things. Such one of the best lessons for me as a kid to travel because I'm not stuck in a way. I always say the most ignorant people and the ones that are more likely to be racist, and this is just my theory, you know, so don't hold me to it because, you know, everybody's always arguing. You can say the sky's blue and they're like, well, there's some clouds over there and it's, you know, gray on this side. Uh, but my, my theory is that People who live further away from airports are more likely to be uh, racist, to be xenophobic, to be uh, segregated. Uh, but the, you, when you think when you move into a city, you want to be closer to uh, information. You want to be closer to access to public transformation, transportation, uh, to be able to travel, get in and out of town. So if you're traveling more, you're around more people that speak different languages. You know, you're eating different foods and you're doing all those things. So you understand the globalization of the world where you're doing business in different time zones. And so that's what 
I received when I was a kid. So now I'm seeing these people that, are, you know, I was probably 16 when it was Operation Desert Shield. So we're, we're sending, and my mom was, she lived or she worked uh, where we were at Shaw Air Base. She worked on the flight line on the base. So what she would do, she was a, a she worked in a kitchen where she, you know, she was like, you know, uh, like a short order cook. You know, my dad was in the military and he was a a, 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 wheel, a welder's technician. So he fixed planes and things, anything that needed to be fixed, my dad could w- put it together. She would see the pilots, they'd land and then they would come in, have lunch, they'd eat and they'd take off again. So when it was Operation Desert Shield, they'd land, they would get ready to take off and fly to the, to the Middle East. They would eat in her, in her cafe and then take off and land in the desert before the army got there and they had to provide air support. Like that was Operation Desert Shield. I'm getting all this information when I'm 15, 16 years old. So I'm learning about all this and how we're protecting our interests in the Middle East. So I'm like understanding foreign policy and, you know, how soldiers move. And I used to go to this base gym every Saturday and Sunday. Runs were at 10 o'clock. You had to get there at 9.45. We'd be waiting outside. You got to run into the gym and put your name on the list. Because if you come at 10.30, now the list is filled, like, you know, just slots to five. So it's filled all the way down to, you know, 15, 20 names. So if you, you get in at 21 or 22, by the time they get there, the runs start getting watered down. So I'm playing with a lot of grown men, and that was part of my experience. But when Desert Shield happened and then Desert Storm happened, when it went from Desert Shield to Desert Storm, all these men got shipped out. So now the run started to be, you know, nobody was in the base gym because everybody was gone. So that perspective helped me understand there's, there's bigger causes here at play. You know, life isn't about me. Nobody cares about my feelings. There are men that are pushing out into the world. And, and, and we're not even talking, talking only about men going to the Middle East. They're going to, to uh, Asia. You know, they're going to, to Germany, you know, bases all over the world because we're supporting those institutions all around the world just to provide support for whatever's going on in the Middle East. So my perspective was always so much different and greater because I understood what it meant to be a part of something. So being a part of a team, you assimilate so much easier because you move in, I have to do my job, but in the same token, I have to be able to understand what it means to take a a back seat. You know, I got to do my job so this person can be great. And if he can be great, then he's going to pull me up with him and then vice versa. You know, the push and pull of being on the team is so important. Parents have to understand this is they, what we're teaching them as coaches, because I coach, you know, in high school and then I help with AAU. What we're teaching them, the parents can't teach them. What we're teaching them, their teachers can't teach them. They're learning a different set of skills with us extracurricular activities. And it's hard. It's not, it's not easy, you know, and, and, and you have to be able to do the things that we're asking you to do. We're not giving them homework like teachers are, but we're saying, don't, don't just only play basketball when we practice, get some work in, get a run in, you know, jog during the street, get some extra conditioning in. Because remember the great players do the stuff that nobody else is willing to do. And they're working when nobody else wants to work. A lot there. I want to touch on one thing that you just said, which is being part of a team. I'm curious, what do you miss the most about being a player? I don't know. There was just a rhythm uh, to, one, physically. You know, your body, you, you know, your, what you're working on, you're paying attention. I didn't worry about my weight ever because it stayed the same. But trying to figure out how you can get an edge, you know, get in the weight room and knowing what your body limitations are. And, you know, it's it's like that sea biscuit mentality. Like we're always measuring ourselves up against um, – it's one thing to do it against the competition, but your teammates, you know, watching what they're doing well and trying to add something to your game. And after practice, I think I had this more when I played in Seattle because I had younger guys. And it was like an experience where I had to learn to be a leader. But after every practice, it was typically in Milwaukee, I would go and shoot. And I always had Michael Red, uh, 
that was always there with me shooting. But in Seattle, I had like four or five to six guys because they were younger and they want to learn. So it was always like a fun competition shooting drills. And everybody was trying to beat me. Everybody wanted to be in competition. And, you know, we had a younger team. So we had players that were coming from overseas. We had uh, players that were trying to make the team. And, you know, sometimes you come from the CBA at that time. And so they were just thirsty for, you know, any, any information that they could receive or learn a drill or, you know, they wanted to be like me and, and have a footing in the league. And so it was always something going on where you were sharpening yourself because even when I was pushing them, they were pushing me because they were trying to beat me and I didn't want to be beat. And so being in Boston and being in Miami, it was the same thing where, you know, in Boston, everybody was typically they would shoot and do their own thing. And Miami was interesting because LeBron always wanted to smoke. You know, LeBron was always like, come on, let's go shoot free throws. And it was a competition. It was that back to that same, all right, what, what, what are we doing today? And that, that, camaraderie in that competition is what I miss because you're always like th th we just practice for two hours to three hours but now the the real dudes step up the real dudes come over to the side and say all right let's 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 get this smoke in and and we'll get a couple shots up and move around the the, the horn and then the free throw competition starts you know and you just over here and you know if if I'm shooting with LeBron if he won two or three times throughout the year he, you know, you're done. The media's over there. Walk right over there with a little swag. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just I just took him down today. You know, he and those are the times that he won, but you know, probably 95% of the time he lost. <laughs> but because it was always me that I would love competing and sharpening my 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 skills against everybody. And that's what made me always so focused. And I'll tell you real quick, one of my favorite shooting uh, competitors that I had that got me off to such an incredible start um, when I was in Milwaukee. And he was a, it was tough to beat. It was like swishes left to right. I couldn't beat him. And it's, um, it's a name that people don't know. He played at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, but Jeff Nordgaard. Yes. And, you know, you guys look him up. But Jeff came in, I think he was a second round pick, and I don't know how long he lasted, but every time we shot, it was like this guy was like money. And I was struggling to try to keep up with him every time. And so it it kind of set me off onto the right pathway to know that, yeah, I can shoot, but am I the best shooter out there? Am I the best worker? Am I the best preparer in situations, not in game situations to apply? And and so I took that with me for the rest of my career. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you what you miss the most is this uh, like pursuit of getting better on the margins. It's that constant pursuit of getting better, and then the the team part is interesting to me because you did mention I think camaraderie. I think for me that's that's probably the thing I miss the most. It's the it's the little competitions you have. Like I miss competing. I miss like that part of it. The wins, the losses, the feelings you get, the highs. I, I some, be honest with you. Sometimes I miss the lows. Mm -hmm. And because then you know you got to get up the next day and yeah, go yeah, back yeah, at it, right? Yeah. But it's those little competitions. It's the shooting competitions, the cards on the plane, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Maybe you're on the road. You go bowling, cornhole now, whatever, whatever it may be. It's interesting. I I, I had you on the ringer podcast. I don't know. This was probably five years ago. We had a very short conversation. You had, a yeah, I was different, moving. yeah, yeah, you yeah, had yeah. a million different media obligations. Yeah. That was my book came out. Your book came out. Uh, and I mentioned to this, this to you then, uh, but it's interesting because you, you bring up that Seattle group and Richard Lewis told me, he's like, I learned how to be a pro from Ray Allen. And I learned how to be a pro from Richard Lewis when he got to Orlando, I, I vividly remember right after he signed, cause I didn't go anywhere in the off season when I played in Orlando, I was there year round. So I would be at the training facility in the summer every day. And it's like the day he signed his deal, right? He's just signed the biggest contract in NBA history. He goes out and he gets a lather for an hour and a half on the court. I'm watching him. We come in September after labor day, whole team comes in. He's the first guy on the court doing his individual work. We practice for a little bit. He goes back at it. And I saw that that whole first season. I'm like, oh, I get it now. 
and he credits you. I credit him. So in some ways, I learned how to be a pro from you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, and, and, but that's the that's the latter effect that it creates because we have a responsibility to grow the game and the league. And, you know, it's, it's something fascinating about being a pioneer in the game. And I'm not saying that I'm a pioneer, but just in life. Because you think about skyscrapers, bridges, airplanes. Man has to be willing to plant a tree whose shade he'll never sit under. You have to have that that understanding. This is You may not get anything from this, but you're pushing the agenda. But what we see today is we see a lot of people that get to positions of power that then now try to shut the gate so nobody else can come through. I don't want to teach anybody else. I don't want to show how I got here. I want to keep all this and hoard it to what to myself and, and people around me. No, you have to push it out. You know, uh, Damon Wilkins is also another guy uh, in Seattle because I would be at the gym and, you know, Richard, he, he, he didn't understand it when I first got there. And, and I noticed it was interesting because they all watched me. Like, they would watch me how I moved in the training room. They watched how I talked. Uh, you know, then I would get to the gym and then I would already be shooting. And they would say stuff like, you already shot? And I was like, yeah, I've been done. I get off the court. You know, I've been done for about 45 minutes. I'm sitting in the locker room ready to go. I'm the the highest paid player on the team and the guy that came in for Gary Payton. So they're like, there's something to this. You already shot and then they're watching me. And then Rashard, he started coming in and he's, you know, we had a conversation on the bus one time and he says, man, look, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get paid how you get paid. So he would come in and he started watching me go through my routine. And then back of the bus, we would talk about it. We would talk about, I told him why I do what I do what I'm working on, what I'm trying to, to improve on and what I'm trying to stay consistent with and why I do it when, as I'm moving throughout the court. And then sure, sure enough, I would get there and then you would see Richard. I would be in the locker room getting dressed and I'd walk out and you see Richard come down the hallway. So the one thing he always did was he never tried to step on my time because he respected that that was time. So he now... My consistency gave him consistency. So he knew now, okay, he's here at this time. Let me carve out the space for my time. So the thing about great teammates and great players is you when you build rhythm and consistency to who you are, and this is life too. Like you, If you show up every day for 10 years doing a job, you don't have to do everything at this level. You just do that same thing simply every single day for 10 years. And now all of a sudden you become the most valued employee irreplaceable, and somebody who is of the utmost importance and value to what you're doing. And that's the guy that ends up getting a raise and, and being the, 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 the stalwart of the business. And that's what I say. Like Anything that I've done in my career, I've just been able to be available. I've outlasted most people. So longevity is super important, but you got you to gotta love doing it and you got to love the process of doing it. And that is ultimately why Richard got that contract. And again, back to the original point, we, we put it out there and I welcomed everybody. You know, let's give shots up. Let's work. Antonio Daniels came to the team and the knock on Antonio Daniels was he couldn't shoot. He was the fourth pick, I think in 2000 or 98. And he, they said he couldn't shoot. He gets drafted. And then, you know, my GM, we, we talked about him and, and he said, what do you think? I said, He'll be great for us. We need more athleticism. We need, you know, you know, uh, more of a, uh, he was, at the time, we were still young, but more of a veteran presence. I was like, we're going to work with him. He's going to see us in the gym. As long as he has that attitude and mentality to come in and work, he'll be fine. And sure enough, he came in the gym. We're shooting, and then he'd ask questions, and then he started moving as we moved, and that became contagious. And then ultimately, we we take San Antonio to six games, and I think it was two thousand and five, and we lose, and they won the championship that year. But we we had a really good team, and that was all because of how we built from within. If you're looking for well crafted clothes and laid back vibes, then you need to check out the Movement Collection from Faraday. The playoffs are coming up, which means I need to look sharp at games, so I've got the Movement dress shirt ready to rock. This thing looks really great, but it's the comfort that does it for me. It's extremely soft and breathable. Plus, it has a longer length, so you can tuck it in, and a true spread collar, so you can wear it with a tie. I just love it. 
Verity is backed by their guarantee of quality, which means they 100% stand behind everything they make. And this season, they're reintroducing the movement sweaters, which are your ultimate layering sweaters, versatile, lightweight, and they have cool max tech to keep you cool and comfortable all day. For listeners of the show, Faraday Brand is offering 20% off your first order when you enter the promo code OM3 at checkout. Go to faradaybrand.com slash JJ and check them out. That's F-A-H-E-R-T-Y dot com slash JJ for 20% off your first order with code OM3. The playoffs are coming up and you can experience the game at home like never before with the unbeatable sound of Sonos Arc. The precise and immersive sound of Dolby Atmos will make you feel like you are in the stadium. We've had the Arc and it really has changed the basketball watching experience. Plus, I just rewatched Oppenheimer with the Arc and I basically had an out of body experience. The design of the Arc is really sleek and it was very easy to install. When the TV is off, stream music, podcasts, radio, audiobooks, and more using the Sonos app, Apple AirPlay 2, or your voice with Sonos Voice Control. And you can never miss a word of my commentary and games when you turn on speech enhancement in the Sonos app. With Sonos, you can start with one speaker and expand your system over time. Everything works together over Wi-Fi so you can group speakers in different rooms and play music throughout your home. So get yourself the ARC and thank me later. Visit Sonos.com to learn more. Funny you bring up uh, guys watching you work out. I mean, I remember after I left the Clippers and those two years in Philly and my two years in New Orleans, I felt that. Yeah. Yeah, I was was older then. Mm -hmm. I was older then. But you had I had a bunch of young guys that I I was trying to help. And and there were certain guys, Landry Shamit, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Frank Jackson, like I would grab them. We do our shooting together, but they knew like that my time was like my time, and they would just they would watch. And I always found that fascinating. It mm-hmm. was it was cool. You you are like famous for getting to the gym on a game day super early, mm-hmm. and I and I I kind of did the opposite. Where my my routine was sacred, similar to yours. I would shoot. I would get my body loose. At 90 on the clock, uh, I would start in the training tra- training room. Then I'd go to the weight room, do all my activations, and I'd do my ball handling. And, like, I had a very specific pregame shooting routine. And I'd, I'd like to finish, if the meeting was at 35 in the locker room, I'd like to finish at, like, 35 minutes and 30 seconds and run right in. I didn't like shooting and then cooling down. I mm-hmm. wanted to, like, build up. Why did you shoot so early? What was the reason behind that? So when I started in Milwaukee... Um, it, it got, to, it was a point where I didn't have a routine and I was just, you know, they, they, they call two buses and then the first bus shows up. And as a rookie, I had to be on the first bus, obviously had no routine whatsoever. So I go on the court, everybody else on the court and I'm over here just throwing the ball up. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm shooting shots and bigs are down on the post working with the coach throwing hook shots. And every time I shoot it. It, you know how it goes. This this guy's knocking the ball out, and I'm like, God, this dude. And and after a while, when I'm working on, on my stuff, I, you know, I'm goofy and you know, looking up in the stands, and you're out there with fans on the floor, you know, yelling and trying to get autographs. And I was like, I have to figure out something. So Chris Ford, you know, uh, rest in peace. He was my my coach my uh, rookie year. Pulls me in. He says, Rook. And he didn't particularly like younger players. He was a veteran coach. He won championships in Boston. He played with Larry Bird, coached Larry Bird. Chris Ford made the first three-point shot in NBA history. Yes, yep. he did. Yep. And so, but he never liked threes. That's the, the interesting thing. He used to always tell me not to settle. You know, that's why I was like, whenever I got to the point where I was, became the leader in threes, I was like, I don't know how that happened. Because <laughs> I that that is, that is not anything that I, I, you know, set out to do. It just, again, you stay around long enough, they're going to start dropping bags of gold somewhere around you because you've done some some pretty significant things. Um, but he told me, you you have to have a routine. You just are aimless. And, you know, he's watching me and I didn't know. Other coaches are watching me. So it started with Michael Curry and Elliot Perry. So we started, you know, when those guys came to Milwaukee, we started, we had like our our little crew where we would – We'd come out on the court, we would shoot our shots, and then we had a rebounder, we had a passer. 
that was the days when we didn't have coaches that would come out and work you out. And, you know, you know, that they, they there just weren't nine player development coaches. Yeah, on staff. no, 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 no. <laughs> Definitely. I see them now. There's like so many. Uh, we didn't really have weight rooms. You know, the, the weight, the strength and condition that we did, our trainers did it. So you were a, a trainer that taped ankles and he put he had a, like a formula. And then even washing our clothes, we had to put it in this little laundry bag. At, and, and then if the trainer didn't do it, you had to take it home with you and wash your own. So it was so much that we didn't do back then. And I know everybody's like, wow, they did that? Yeah. I was like, yeah, we, it, we've we come a long way. Uh, we even had to walk through the airport in Milwaukee, park in the parking garage, walk through the airport, go through security, walk to your gate. And then the plane was our plane. But the year before, it was commercial. Like you flew with everybody else. Well, you, you, you didn't go to the private hangar is what you're saying. You went to the commercial airport, General Mitchell or whatever it's called. General Mitchell International. <laughs> we walked, you park in the parking. That's why you couldn't, you couldn't, like the luxury of just driving up and then somebody takes your cars and they park it for you. There was none of that, you know, when I first got into league. So you had to find a parking spot. So a lot of times if you put, in Milwaukee, you didn't have to worry about traffic, but sometimes parking lot was packed and you had to walk from way over there and you know come through the security so and and obviously 9-11 hadn't happened yet so you could it wasn't as strenuous coming through the airport but it was it was a, a constraint that you had to deal with and so th these these things and how we built into who we become who we were at a at a young age in our careers it helped us have appreciation you know, for everything that we've come to know and, and and learn about the league. And so as I'm building who I am, we used to, so we, we would not take the first bus. So Mike, myself, we would get up in the morning. Ghost bus. The go, um, what did you guys call it? The ghost bus? We just cut taxi. <laughs> uh, we paid for it. We rotate who paid the taxi. We would, we got up for the morning, have breakfast, rotate who paid for breakfast. Uh, those guys were good because, you know, our trainer used to always put uh, fruits in our room so they would never use the mini bar. So every time Mike would come to the, the bus or the taxi, you know, for shoot around in the morning, he'd have, I mean, he's like, man, I can't mess with that. You know, mini bar is too much money. So it gave me a, a perspective. I was like, don't mess with the mini bar. Mini bar is what's going to get you. So I learned how to get a routine up with those guys early get my shots up and then move around and then they got traded away and then it, for a while I was by myself and I started creating my routine without a rebounder because coaches weren't there early enough and then after a while then we started getting the coaching staff and they started bringing these guys in and then coaches made sure there was somebody out there so not then I had a coach with me so I would go through my routine you know and I had a rebounder and, and a lot of times for the most part I had such a, a rhythm that that coach would just rebound and then and then he got so consistent with what I was going to do and it it was my purpose and and this is a sidebar I'm playing golf in Mexico with a couple of friends and I'm standing over this wedge shot I'm about I've heard this story before and yeah. it's so good I'm, tell it please I'm about 90 yards in and I'm sitting here and there's no water there's nothing and the flag is standing right in front of me and I was like oh god I don't even know where this ball is going to go and so I, I thought about that. I said, wow, this is actually what I do in basketball. I don't, I used to go to the range and hit my driver seven times. Like, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And I realized I don't practice these shots. I don't practice the different nuances of golf to then expect to be good at it. You know, I'm like, just if I could find a ball, great. Then I could advance it. So I started saying, I need to start practicing these wedge shots so I can get closer to the green and understand what I need to do. And I said, that's what I do in basketball. I'm, I will come down the floor and make a move where I don't even know what's going to happen. Dribble between the legs, crawl, crawl, and go up in the air and just kind of figure it out, figure it out as I'm up there. And so I said, from that moment forward, on a golf course, when I play basketball, I'm going to work every single contingency with my game on every angle, every court, tired. So I started running from the full court all the way into my threes because that's what happens in the game. So you you figure all these guys running the transition, they come in and they shoot a three, and it's like you're actually shooting a shot that you don't practice. You know, full court running, deep sprint, there's seven seconds on the clock and you got to get to your lift. And you got to shoot that ball and there's a seven-footer running out at you. 
what is your lift going to look like? You got to practice that. That right there, if I see somebody, if I walk in the gym and see somebody shooting like that, I'm like, this kid right here, he's going to be problems because he gets it. But I, I walk in the gym a lot, including the kids I coach, and I watch them jump that high when, when we're going through shooting drills. And then when the game starts and we do practice, you see them jump higher. And I said, now you miss. They shoot the ball over the rim because now you're shooting at a different release point. And so I figured that out because I had some pretty good coaches that watched me and, and spoke to me and then, you know, just challenged me to stay consistent in my jump. And that's why when I go to the gym, I jump the same way every time. I don't stray from that because my percentages have a chance of being higher than the, me saying, you know, I'll figure it out as I go because the switch, turning the switch on, you'll see a lot of great players that can play at a high level, but they can't keep it consistent. I'm always jealous. I've told Luca this. There's a, the Mar is the same way. Like I watch them warm up and I'm like, man, I wish I could warm up at that pace. Yeah, you it's know, just like, it's just different, dude. It's just even like Demar when he does his pregame, he's shooting like essentially flat-footed middies, and then he gets in the game and he's elevating over people, and it's like, and Luca has his own pace to his workout, and it's just different. And I, I'd never had that luxury. I, I'm curious about your, uh, specifically like Boston, Miami. Um, I'm going to get into a young Ray Allen in a second because I love the uh, highlight montages that pop up on social media uh, two or three times a year of you dunking on people. But yeah. the the catch-and-shoot version of Ray Allen, there's just not a lot of guys that play that way. What was required to play that way? You brought up the the full-court sprints going into a three. What did a workout let's say in the off season look like for you? Did you, did you just run? Did you do sprints or were your basketball workouts all sprints? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, no, because it, it was, it was, there was half court stuff. Like you starting off drills and I uh, have little drills where you, you, um, you know, you run from underneath the basket from the sideline and you, you kind of run across the baseline you open up, you slow down, slow down and sprint and curl around the top and you, you know, inside foot, shot, uh, elevate. And then you backpedal to the other side and you come back and do the other side. Yeah, you know, and and if there's a progression. You do two of those, you do four of those. And then once you do two, then you sprint down to the other side and you come to the baseline, you do the same thing. So you get used to working at a high pace, but in small spaces. You know, so that's what happens in the games. Like, Train yourself how to run and be locked in into the conditioning of it, but then you got to slow down and then sprint again. So the conditioning has to be there on a high level. That's why I started cycling. That's why I'd, I've always been a cross-country runner. So I would run to get cross-training to put my body under stress in different circumstances, you know, so I can last, you know. So, you know, it's one thing quick sprints, but, you know, I don't go to the bench during a timeout <laughs> just panting, you know, trying to catch my breath because I've already pushed past what this game might may present me. And then can I get to that speed and that lift without being tired and can I recover? Just the whole, I think the whole point is, is to, to, to be able to recover quicker than everybody else out on the floor. So when you co co can recover quicker, now you can do more. Now you can you can keep running off screens and you can get to a spot and then you can pump fake and you get to the hole and you can jump in the air and you can dunk on somebody and you can finish a layup because now you have, you don't feel that fatigue uh, appear in your body because some people can't do it, don't have a second jump. You know, some people get down to the paint and I see it a lot in college basketball, uh, men and women, they get to the paint, they made a move and now there's nothing left. You know, they put a layup in but they didn't explode up. That's just training. That's just pushing your body to a level past your comfort zone and past what your coaches might present for you. And so it does require, you know, you figure working on your quads. That that's what cycling, you know, why cycling is good for you. You can't, you can't substitute it. So you got to run on the streets because your legs need to feel the the your muscles, you know, accepting the 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 stabilization, you know, every time you hit the ground. Um and then doing long distance runs where you could sustain over a long period of time. But in the same token, we used to do sprints on the field, you know, before the season started, we would do ladders, you know, as training just to work on sprints 
and sustain that for long periods of time. I used I used to probably like f with five years to go in my career. This is around the time I lived in New York, so maybe last four years in every off season, because I had always done sprints and then I did sprints within the workout in my shooting drills, right? And then I started doing uh, like baseline level runs. So I'd try I'd I'd have a heart rate monitor on and I'd try to get to like one twenty five to one thirty five for like fifteen straight minutes just to have like a baseline of VO2, right? And then you mix in, you know, some treadmill sprints or whatever it may be, all monitored. All right, let's try to get it up to 180. It's like mixing in that very, my favorite drill, by the way, I started doing this right when I started playing for the Clippers in the off season. It was 12 shots and each shot was different and each version of the drill was a little different. But to me, it simulated how I played and it was a perfect training like tool for me. So it would look like this, like I'd start a right, right, right high quadrant. I'd get a swing pass, one dribble, step up three, immediate sprint to the right corner, catch and shoot three. I'd kind of jog along the baseline to your point, sprint to the Same corner, speed. side shot fake side step three. And then I'd have another screener or cone sprint off a wide pin down and I'd either catch and shoot or I turn the corner, get to my float game. It's four shots, right? Then I'd go right back to the right high quadrant, do it again, and I had to make nine out of twelve. Right. And if I got that's nine out of twelve, if, if I got nine out of, it's tough because mm -hmm. it's all different shots. Like that's the thing. The practice vari variability for me was a huge thing. I didn't take, especially later on in my like, I stopped shooting a lot of spot threes because I'm like, I don't shoot you spot threes. No, you not very rarely. I, I, I'm always on the move. And so let's say I, I I got nine out of twelve. I got to switch sides. If I didn't get nine out of twelve, I had to do that shit again. And that's the and all of a sudden you start going a couple rounds eight for twelve. By the end of it, you're fatigued. That's how I built up. Yeah, and that's the imposed pressure you yes. have to put on yourself. Yes. Coaches can't put it on you. Yes, you have to put it on yourself. But to that point, uh, it was fascinating too when you played in 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 L. A. You actually played the way I played in Boston because you had Doc. <laughs> that was yeah. That was Doc's free agent pitch to me. Yeah, he's like, you've been used the wrong way in Orlando. Mm -hmm. I want you to play like Ray Allen. And I was like, say no more. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I just want to be Ray Allen. Yeah, and that and that was because I watched and I was like, this is all the stuff. You you yeah. made the offense go. Yeah. You know, because as much as you're moving, you're moving in a way that the team shifts. We, you know, you and I more than anybody, and I think Kyle Corver was a little had a little bit of it. Um but we were we were averted. And this is this is, you know, not to compare us to like Shaq. When I played, he was such a demander of a double team and sometimes a triple team, and the defense really shifted. When we shot the ball, we were on the floor and we moved. The defense shifted. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't understand that movement, how how much it had to shift, because you're moving to help, and then everybody else has to shift into that help. And when we get open, everybody's open, you know, and that right there was why the work for us, we did the heavy lifting. You know, we either, we're the ones that just that little bit of move, we get open there, everybody's like, shit. And then bam, shot. And then even when we don't want to take the shot, you swing it real quick. And then now the shift happens, they could beat that shift. It's constant awareness. Mm -hmm. Like, cause I, I mean, I, I had to guard you in two playoff series. Mm -hmm. It's just constant awareness. And that takes its toll on me right having to chase you and you it can't takes rest its, and it takes its toll on the defense because it's because to your point it's like you're coming off a stagger screen on the baseline i'm chasing and and big baby setting a screen and kg setting a screen or perk setting a screen and you're okay, already behind his, his man is now engaged the guard as you as you came off the curl he, he's engaged you've got options now it's just that shifting defense. I won't go back to the thing about the nine for 12 because I, I trained some guys uh, this summer, a uh, couple of couple NBA guys this summer, and I didn't really... I hope they paid you well. I was free. It was <laughs> free, man. I'm not, I'm not a keen, man. It's free. <laughs> yeah. It was free. I'm just, it's free game, man. Yeah. No, but I, I, it was interesting because I, I, I'm putting th them through these workouts, and um, I realized, like, it was all shit that I did, and I built it around, you know, t like Ty Jerome, for instance, he's with the Cavs. Like, he's more of an on-ball guy. So I built his workout around his skill set, right? But it was the same sort of concepts and same sort of pace. Um, 
And I realized that everything that I did as a player in a workout had consequences. And it, you, you, you brought up like the, the building in the pressure, right? So like I've already simulated that six days a week all summer long for years, which leads me to something you said to me. Uh, it had incredible meaning. First of all, there's two things that you did for me in my career that were incredible. Number one, I brought up the, uh, the 09 playoff series. Yeah, Milwaukee. Um, no, the 09, when uh, Celtics were like, oh, yeah, 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 when yeah, we yeah. beat you guys, you guys didn't yeah. have KG. I, you know, yeah. I'm fine admitting that. You guys didn't have KG. Yeah. But I basically, you were coming off a, a Chicago series where you averaged like 24 a game. You had a 51-point game in game six. You shot like 47% from three. And so Stan going into that series was like, you have zero help responsibilities. So if you guys run a strong side pick and roll where you're in the corner and Rondo's coming middle and Perk is rolling, you have no help responsibilities. You do not, you are never required to tag. So my job was just to chase you. And you didn't shoot well that series. And I remember we, we win in the garden in game seven. And it was a, an important moment for me. You did two things. You came over to me and acknowledged that I guarded you well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you went to the press conference. You did something which not a lot of guys will do. And that's you acknowledged that I did a good job. It gave me such confidence. It was like that whole playoff run was the turning point in my career. And that moment for me was massive. I just want you to know that. The second thing was when I was in Milwaukee, and you were in Miami. We played you guys in the first round. And I know it happened in Milwaukee, so it had to have been game three or four. And you came up to me during a free throw or coming Just out of a four. timeout. Yeah. Or, and you said to me, you said something along the lines of, I see it on your face. I see it in your body language. You're not yourself. You talked about it a little bit ago. You said being the most valuable employee is being the same guy consistently over and over. And in a way, I had lost myself. Yeah. And I and I was like, fuck, he's right. Did you ever lose yourself, by the way? Did you ever feel that? You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think Skiles was your coach. No, he had gotten fired. Or he had mutually parted ways in January, about okay. a month before I got there. Who, who was coaching then? Uh, Jim Boylan. Okay. Not the Chicago Bulls Jim Boylan. The mm -hmm. older one that was with T. Lou in, mm -hmm. in Cleveland. So the thing is, is that there's no point where you're like, we're competing against each other. Like I can pay homage to greatness. You know, I see people working I see people who love it. Those are the people who I want to support, you know, even doing an interview uh, to have a conversation with media. This is not a scolding session. It's not you know, it's just, it's, it's accountability in a good way. A lot of times speaking to the media is therapy. So to be able to do that, we have this responsibility, not only to share the game, to speak the game, to, to, uh, communicate the game. You know, every time a reporter asks us a question, like, oh, sometimes it may be a dumb question. Just say, can you please reward that question? I, I'm not understanding what you're asking me. Um, but then even the, the, the communication with each other. Like, I don't have beef with another guy in the league. He's getting paid just like I am. And he's trying to win and do all these things. And I know there's a struggle for all of us. But if you pull back the curtain, there's a little kid in there that's so excited about playing his game and just remembers who, who he loved and, and how he wanted to get to this moment he's at. So I had to always remember, play for him. You could see that in each kid, you know, slash player, like who they were when they first came in, especially if they were younger when they came in the game. I was like, I remember you at Duke and, you know, the energy. And it's like, that's why I said that. And I've seen that because you, you, you wanted to win and you were in such a tough situation at the time. And I had been there, you know, I had been there in places where I was the victim. I was the villain. I was the the one that was being counted out and i just wanted to remind you that this is going to pass but in this process don't lose yourself because you still have to you're preparing yourself to be something great for somebody down the line and and i saw it firsthand because as much as i lost in seattle 
And as much as I wanted to stay there when I got traded to Boston in 2007, there was something greater in store for me. And it was because I didn't lose myself. It was because I was sitting there just waiting to be served up on a platter to something great that I can get take myself over the top. And that happened to be, you know, playing in Boston. It was such the um, most amazing situation. And then going to Miami and then being in even uh, – uh, equally great situation to be able to put ourselves in chance to win. And I was so happy for you when you went to Philly because now you're in that position where now you're seeing success consistently, regardless of what happened at the end of the year. Now you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're prime time, you know? And that's the thing I think people forget with success is like, you can't become downtrodden or beat up by the media. Remember where you are. You know, because the guys that make it to the NBA have such a, they can have such a mentality of, woe is me, you know, my life is the worst, uh, uh, I, I, I need to do that. And then you make the all-star team, and then everybody's like, oh, well, I'm trying to do this, and I, you know, I need to work. Then you make the Olympic team, no, no matter what levels you ascend to, you know, being drafted is, the, is, is a great sign of success. But you still, that doesn't mean you've, you've made it, but you still have to continue to work to get better. And if you ever think that you're great, that's the minute and you slide. And that was always for me. Somebody asked me, so when did you realize you were great? I said, never. <laughs> I was like, never. When you retired? Yeah. I, I, you know, I never sat back and counted my chips because I was always afraid that if I, if I, if I slid at some point, then somebody's going to catch up to me. Like, is somebody going to? And and the thing is, I'm telling everybody my what I do working out. You can see it; it's documented. Can you commit to it? That's the thing that greatness supplies us all: is the ability to find what it is that you can do well. But can you commit to it? Everybody in the beginning of the year is going to win the NBA championship. Everybody in the beginning of the year wants to make the All Star team, like. Everybody has these goals until it gets hard. And when it gets hard, oh, man, coach don't like me. You know, I want to get traded. You know, this player, you know, screw him. That, that's what the bad teams do. And even the good teams, when they hit that stride of complacency, mediocrity, like struggle, they just talk more. You know, you sit on the plane, as you mentioned earlier. Also, some of the times that I, I missed the most because my, my bank wad used to be like that thick because you're playing poker on the, uh, on the plane. It was Boo-Ray for me. It was yeah, Boo-Ray, Boo-Ray too. Me. Like we, we had all these games going and you're like, you got to make sure you come with some ammunition. But those are the times when we, we got so good and we became a unit because we communicated with each other and we didn't run off the separate corners of the plane and just said, screw everybody. No, I was like, come on, we lost. Let's go get the car game. We talk about it, and then all of a sudden we have fun. When we get off that three- to five-hour flight, wherever we were going, we were square with each other. And we knew, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to get come in and get some shots up. So it was never animosity because we got to do this. It's too long of a season to be mad at somebody. <laughs> you know that. Like, you got to be able to get that stuff off your chest. The 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 thing you said to me in in that 2013 playoff series i think it was it was such a valuable lesson in a different type of personal accountability um because at at that point in my career i had had some fucking punches to the face you know particularly early in orlando and you know i I never was going to start for stan van gundy right he didn't view me as that he leaves dwight gets traded that year before I got traded to to Milwaukee was like a fun year even though we weren't winning because it was like the first time I got to be a leader there was no expectations right and it was like the first time Jacques Vaughn was like yeah go go move go play and it was like so it was like in a way fun and then you get trade so I had taken personal accountability but it was a different type because I get traded it's a little bit of a shock to the system I mean year seven first time getting traded it was nothing against the city of Milwaukee, the Bucks organization. It was just a weird, it was a weird team. It was. It was a weird, it was like dynamic on the on the on the roster. No. Interim coach, nothing against Jim Boylan. It was just I kind of got placed in this situation and I lost myself for a couple months. And I was like, that's I'm still doing my work, but like I I lost that edge. I lost that like 
no, nah, fuck it. I'm not going to worry and victim victimize myself here because of the circumstances, right? Can't allow that to happen again. No. It was super valuable. You brought up going to Boston. Everybody talks about, and you guys have talked a ton about the sacrifices you you guys had to make and and the stage of the, your career you at when you got there. Um, what is what does this sacrifice mean beyond just how many shots per game you get or your usage rate? Like, what did what did how did the sacrifice that the three of you guys have to make? How did that manifest beyond just shots? I remember because it's it's pretty interesting because I'm doing this now as a coach uh, to my kids. Like, whenever they know they're not going to score, they just kind of dribble, like, nice and easy, and they just kind of, like, pass the ball. And I'm like, dude, you got to cut harder than that because that actually happened to me. My first year, I'm I'm just, like, there's this play that we had where, you know, I, I pop out underneath a, a – a big that's on the block, I pop out, catch it, and I look in, throw it back, and then I cut back in, and then there's a screen, and but the ball's going to go opposite. So when I did it, I just kind of lollygagged through the cut. Meandered about. Yeah. Doc was like, you got to cut harder than that. And it kind of like, kind of pissed me off because I had never been pushed in that sense, you know, because offensively, I was always the, the, the guy. And he was always sitting around me. But in this situation, the ball was going somewhere else. And so it it kind of kind of got into my my soul a little bit because I was I was mad that he kind of went at me. But he was right. I had to be willing to make the cut so somebody else can get an opportunity because they needed to believe that I was going to get the ball. And if I if I wasn't capable of doing that then our offense doesn't work. And Doc used to always say, our offense has to work like uh, a football offensive line. You know, you got guys that are pulling, that are blocking in certain directions, and they're doing everything they can to get the either the quarterback some time, create a hole for the running back, or the receiver has to block downfield to know this play is coming in a direction, knowing they're not going to touch the ball. That's super important when you're playing on, especially if you're a guy that scored well somewhere else, and now you're coming to a new team and you're asked to be take to you're being asked to take less. It's being able to win on that team's terms and not on your terms, you know. Because the phrase of my game is is needs to be thrown out the the window. Your game happens when you're playing pickup basketball. You got to get it. You get to go out there. Every kid, by the way. We're losing kids playing 21 in the park where you're experimenting. You know where the hoop is. You get so comfortable. You have to be able to understand my game does not exist in team basketball. Now, you have to be so selfishly unselfish, which means do your job, work on your game, work on your shot, be a great free throw shooter, be a great dribbler. So now when the team is assembled and you're in a game situation, you can get plugged in into any of these situations to be able to help a coach be the general to put you in places where he can help you be effective in a team. If I need you to set a screen and then pop, you're going to set a hard screen and you're going to pop because you can do that. And then when you catch it, you may not shoot the ball, but you're going to drive as hard as you can. If you have a shot, great, but then this guy's going to be open. All get, Being able to put all these kids in these situations because they're multifaceted with their skill set is the most important thing. But are guys willing to make that sacrifice that at the end of the game, I'm going to make a play that this other dude is going to get the shot. That is what it, in Seattle, I had the ball in my hand 90% of the time, you know, at the end of games and whether I shot the ball or not, I understood who's open and where the ball should go, but I was the score. It was coming down to me. In Boston, I was somewhere around it, you know, where I was create, helping create the action. Don't but be I, humble. You hit some clutch shots for Boston. I, I did. <laughs> I did. But, but that again, it goes, it goes to the, the point of we actually had a system 
where I'm running up to set a, a screen on Paul, KG's flaring me, and now Paul drives and he knows I'm wide open in the corner because he's now making those plays because he also understood, like, we want to win. This isn't about, you know, Paul, one of, one of my favorite uh, game winners is in Charlotte. Charlotte had our number. They had, uh, uh, I think uh, Jason Richardson was on the team. Um, uh, what was the dunker? Uh, Jared Wallace. Jared Wallace. He gave us so many fits because they used him as a stretch four. And for the most part, KG was always underneath the basket. So when they stretched him out on the perimeter, he was shooting from, from the perimeter and he was driving and dunking. And so... We, I mean, every time we played them, we had a difficult time. So we were down at this point. And, you know, by hook or by crook, we ended up coming back. And I don't remember if we were down one or two. But uh, they're taking the ball out. Uh, Eddie House gets his hand on the ball. Paul gets on out of bounds play. Paul gets the ball. And Paul doesn't even think to shoot it. I'm at the top of the key and I just rotate. Paul just turns and throws it. And I get it off. Buzzer goes off, and then it goes in, and then you can see the Charlotte guys just lay down, like, you know, because they played they played a, an amazing game, but we just knew how to win. And that is the difference in the great teams and the average teams, not only in the NBA, but in every sport. And specifically basketball, you got to make your free throws, you can't turn the ball over, and you got to rebound. And those three points – are the points that allow teams, the good teams, to know how to close games at the end. And we just always knew how to do that. But it always, it was born from the idea we knew where everybody was going to be. And we stayed there, like, just explicitly knowing that I'm going to give Paul room to operate. But when the minute they turn their head, I'm cutting. Lay up, bam. And everybody knew it. I think the, the phys- it's interesting when you, we first started on that, the, the physical, act of being a decoy is such a different experience and i you know having played against you guys the sacrifice i think for like kg was like all right now i'm going to become the best screener in the nba and by the way the motherfucker said some illegal picks KG, illegal because he would put his KG, hand out like this yeah, KG, yeah. you said some illegal motherfucking yeah. picks. He, he always like this yeah his hands out here and he told you but but it it, it is that it's interesting because I think what was I feel like different about your team, even initially, it wasn't there. I don't. I'd never felt like you know, inside of playing against you guys and watching you guys that year, there wasn't like a a, a, a growing in period of figuring it out together. The skill sets all complement each other, and there was never that thing that happens sometimes with the big three, which is like my turn, your mm-hmm. turn. Uh-uh. Um, where you you guys could kind of all operate in the same ecosystem doing the things that you were good at. And I think that's part of what made it unique. I also want to use this opportunity because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And you brought up the my game thing. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about sacrifice. I think an overlooked thing when we talk about the NBA and certain players, like when we talk about a guy's individual talent, or you know his skill set it's like we 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 lose what makes a good basketball team work if rondo and you are out on a break on a three on two and the big doesn't run to the rim you're not going to be open if he doesn't draw that low man in rondo can't make that kick pass to you right why don't we highlight rim runs that lead to open shots? Every time Luca's in a pick and roll and Derek Lively rolls to the rim and Luca sprays out to Tim Hardaway, it's a great pass from Luca. It's an open three from Tim Hardaway. We never highlight the fact that Derek Lively drew in the defense. He has to dive. We, we have tracking now where we can track screen assists. Why don't we put that in a fucking box score? I'm serious. No, it's a, it's a lot. Of- this is basketball. Mm-hmm. This is basketball. It's not my game. Mm-hmm. It's all the things. Like I always talk, I always talk about like an NBA team, a basketball team. It's like an organism, right? Yeah. And you have to feed it certain things, and all the different parts of the organism have to work properly for it to be a healthy functioning organism. Yeah. And it it's so much more than just my game. 
And and I think this is where it comes down to watching film and being able to be, you know, we're talking about guys that really can coach and kind of break it down. Like I, I have kids uh, that I coach, you know, I had to teach them pick and roll uh, this year because a lot of our sets were pick and roll stuff. And I told them all these, a lot of these teams that we play against, they want to just run zone all day long and they don't want to teach their kids basketball. I said, this is why these kids aren't going to college. And so my kids, they would, they started off, they would run a pick and roll and they would stop because they would see the big hedge. Coach, the big was right there. I can't go. I said, I would say, stop, do it again. Where's the big at? Show me. And he showed me, he's right there. I said, so what should you do? He was like, um, I was like, go around him. I want you to drive him, draw him out. Let's see what this guard does, if he can come back. So then what they started doing is they'd see the big and they'd reject the pick and roll. And I had to explain to him, I said, offensively, we were trying to build a rhythm to our offense. I know that individually you can reject this pick and roll and you get to that mid-range and you can shoot it. But how does that help our offense? How does that destroy their defense and make their defense stretch? You have to go off the pick and roll, see how if that big is going to stay. What if he doesn't stay with you? And then the big this guard gets caught up in the screen and now you got downhill. And then something else comes out and then bam, you swing it and now you got a three over here. And I said, there's so many things that happen in a pick and roll situation that you have to understand. And being a point guard, you have to be able to lead the team. I got a kid too that, you know, I always tell him play off two feet. Play off two feet extends your opportunities. Because if you commit to one, you're in the air. And if the guy's bigger than you and he can jump high, that shit is getting blocked. Or you're going to travel or you're going to take a really crazy shot. But if you play off two feet, now you can pump fade, you get to the free throw line, you can see your shooter, there's nothing there, then you can swing it right back out. Kids wanted to get it the first time, I always say that. You know, you guys want to get it the first time, you can't get it the first time. You got to be patient and see, pump fake, pump fake, pump fake. I tell my son that all the time we watch the game, I said, see how they played off two feet? And then they spit back and they swung it and then they got an open shot. Um, so it is, it is coaching. It is teaching the game. It is watching film. It's showing the, the the kids what sets what we're looking for in each set. Like I'll I'll, I'll draw up a set. I know it works because I've seen it, and I watch college games and I steal stuff from other coaches. This all who knew who knows how to run plays. You know we take stuff from other people and we try to implement it. You you know most coaches I tell kids you see kid coaches that are really good, they might be great out of timeouts. You know they might you know uh, be a a flare setting team. You know, they might be a great post up team. Like you you'll see the the you know how they operate. So you guys have to be able to execute the game plan and 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 plays out of a timeout, specifically sideline out of bounds and baseline out of bounds. You know, we should be able to score or get an opportunity to score every time, but you guys, you can't mix it up. You got to be in the right spots. You can't half-ass through the, the, the cuts. You got to set screens. Like all those basic fundamentals are ultimately what makes teams really what really good. You're able to score, and it and it levels them up to the next to get to the next step. Because if you can't do these things, then you can't score. Then they say we get beat by 15, 20 every night, and that is the first step to that kid retiring from that sport. It's very interesting. I want to talk about shooting. Mm -hmm. You're a pretty good shooter. Um, <laughs> Steph Curry on Hot Ones said that uh, if he was to teach someone how to shoot, he would teach Clay Thompson's form. Um, I wanted to shoot like you, like not just like makes and misses, but like I legitimately wanted to shoot a jump shot like you, release point. I even shot a flatter shot because you shot a flatter shot. <laughs> When you look at different guys shooting the basketball, I'm curious how you learned how to shoot that way, why it worked for you specifically, but also how would you teach? And I know you, you have with your kids, but how would you teach and who would you emulate for shooting the basketball? Well, again, I, I think that the, there's a, a similar uh, analogy uh, to golf. Like you take somebody who can't, who's never swung a golf club and they want golf lessons. First thing I would say is go play golf, go to the range, hit balls for a couple, a week or so, and then come back and let me see what your body has developed. Now, 
you know what your body can and cannot do. And now we can work from there. Cause I don't want to try and force you in a position that you, you can't get to, you know, tightness, like whatever athletic ability is. Sometimes a guy will go to a golf instructor and the golf instructor is trying to make them get to a space that their body just can't get to. So if I'm teaching, I'm watching the kid exactly what they can and cannot do based on their physical limitations or, you know, uh, 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 abilities. Right. Not everyone can shoot a jump shot like you. Yeah. That's a fact. Mm-hmm. Like Joel Embiid has great form, but Joel Embiid's not going to sh- elevate no. 28, 30 inches off the ground on the shot. It's just not, not going to happen for him. But what I will do is, because I have the issue with my, with my sons, so every kid at a young age, you know, a lot of times what happens, and I found this fascinating, because my boys at a younger age, and even my 17-year-old now, he, he doesn't do it anymore, but he used to push from underneath his chin. So he pushed the ball up like that. Why? Because they're using their body power-wise because they don't understand shooting and they think that's what they need to thrust the ball in the air. So, you know, we have a trampoline, you know, in, in our yard and the boys are bouncing up and down on a trampoline and they got, you know, the hoops on, on both sides. So they're, I mean, they're over here, like they, their, their games are, are always like fascinating. Look out the window and watch them because they'll do backflips between the legs. Like, my now 12-year-old, he's had a dunk contest where he's, like, doing everything, spins and dunking, and then he shoots it. And I was watching him one time shoot this basketball. He's got the ball in his hands. He's going with rotation and everything. And I was like, so he can shoot like that with his fingertips. But when he gets a bigger ball, he's shooting because now that ball's too big for him. So now he's hoisting. Now he's pushing from underneath his chin. Now his form's off. He's just trying to get the ball in there. And the thing is, is he'll be proficient at still making the shot because he can adjust. He can adapt. So in many instances, the kids at young age definitely need smaller balls. So it doesn't help them develop that habit of pushing. And then when they get older, now he's at the age where he's still doing the same things. You, you know, you see a lot where the kids end up doing like this. And everybody's follow through is right here. And I always tell them, don't follow through with your guide hand. It's always right here. Don't do that because that's what they're used to doing from here. So now they evolve to get up here and they're doing the same thing. So the first thing that I I tell every kid when they shoot is I watch how they hold the ball. Because a lot of times they hold it in their palm. So remember, if I and I what I do is I'll throw the football, have a football, throw it at them. You never catch the football down here, you know, and then I throw a golf ball at them. You don't catch the golf ball like that. You catch it up here. I said, so when I give you the basketball, don't catch the basketball here. So when you shoot, the last thing happens is it rolls off your fingers. So now if you're on the free throw line, watch, watch college, watch the pros, you know, pros do it because they're skilled at it. They're adept at it. But some other guys are really bad shooters because they let the ball start here. And then it rolls all the way here, all the way to here. And now once it gets to here, their motion is already right here. They have no touch and they have to push. Josh Hart. Yeah, so it gets here. And it's like it's like they're pushing with their arm to get the ball off their hands. It's not in their wrist anymore. It's interesting. If we think about basketball shooting, not as a push, but a throw. Mm-hmm. If I was throwing a baseball, unless I was trying to throw a fucked up pitch, mm-hmm. I would not throw with my palm. Never. Was, even a football. You hold it right here. Yeah, it's the, it's the fingers that are releasing. Mm-hmm. It's not the palm. There's obviously some shooters, uh, Mike Dunleavy, Damian Lillard, that shoot on their yeah, palm. They let, but I watch all of them. Some of them that shoot in the palm, they got to do like this because they got to really throw it. And they get really adept at being able to do yeah. that. But specifically kids, because I always watch it and I try to get them to see it. And, and, and I even pull up my own clips. And I don't want everybody to have to shoot it like me, but I've had success because I duplicated those same habits. And we're talking about getting the ball off fast. You know, you're talking about moving your feet and getting the ball off quickly. So if you look at me on the free throw line, the one thing that you'll see is the ball is always served up. So you, you could put your hand through my, uh, right here on my palm and the ball's sitting up here. It's not sitting like that flat. Right. What happens is they're holding the whole ball because they're, it's an insecurity because most people say, oh, I'm not feeling the ball. It's not going to, you know, I'm, and then they end up pushing like this whole hand. No, we just need you right here. 
it's it's born from kids at a young age that aren't strong enough, that not working at you know their wrists and shooting free throws. And that's why I said, I'm whenever when whenever I competed in three point contests, I didn't shoot threes. I went to the free throw line. It's one thing to get my lift, but it's another thing to work on my release point. And shooting free throws is all release, and I'm working on catching the ball and feel comfortable with the ball in my hand, breathing and feeling this whole motion. Now it's a match. Can I match my lift with my release? That is the 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 the, the trick. Because once you get into a real game, if you can match that, now you're cooking with hot grease. It's really interesting. When I would have bad shooting workouts, what, when you would have a bad shooting workout, I'm assuming you did the same thing. Like if I felt like man, everything's just not in alignment right now. My muscle memory's off. I just stop the drill. And go right to the free go throw right line. Go right to the free throw line. Mm -hmm. Let me figure this out. The release point thing is huge. The shot in the corner over Tony Parker, when we were talking earlier about preparation and routine, one of the most famous shots in NBA Finals history, one of the most famous shots in NBA history. What went into that shot? Uh, that day, you, you you think about that series. That's game six. So I did that in just if you just think about those six games, I did that at least 30 to 40 shots before every game. And then every shooting routine, you know, before practice in between. Uh it was just, it was just a um it was for me, it was a, a right that I had to to be able to push on a daily basis to be able to move and shoot a shot where I can go sideways and then ball comes up in the air. Because now what happens is you see kids, they don't understand it when I'm yelling at them in practice saying faster, faster. Don't, you know, and, and you know, we'll shoot spot shots just to get them work on their release. And then I'll put them through drills where they got to run. So I have a drill where you start this basket, this basket, full cart, court. So this team, there's three guys here, three here, um, maybe four here and four here. This side, they're on team. So when they shoot, they got to run to this side. So each basket, you got to make 15 shots. So if this basket finishes with 15 first, then they all can run down in there and help this team, you know, shoot their 15 and whoever's finished wins. There's consequences you have to run. But I told them, what makes this drill easier for you is the opposite of what you think. Because if you shoot and you lollygag down to the other end, that means by the time you get down there, your rest is less. So now by the time you get down there, now you're about to have to shoot again and you're always behind. So when you shoot, haul ass down here to get more rest. Now you got two or three people in front of you. Now you can rest and you can gather yourself and you can go right into your shot. So the sprint is the magic. That's why you do it. Run as hard as you can to rest. Just that's what happens in games. And then take your game shot. If you can, if you can practice that, so you put yourself in situations that you're always used to being able to catch the ball sideways, pew, go up in the air. Because remember, shooting is just that little space that you have. You can't come from way over there in one spot to here. Like you're always in a confined space. You know, you watch the guy spacing, and if you're on this baseline, you just slide to the left or to the right a little bit. You slide to the right, and then you go up in the air and shoot. So you just got chop, 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 up in the air. You don't have a chance to go chop, chop. Gather. And then shoot. <laughs> yeah. And so- I think that's what's the, the most amazing thing about that shot, though, is that it was in such a confined space. And, and truthfully, a confined amount of time, too. Yeah, and like you know- about shooting, you shot so many shots in your routine, you know where the basket is. Like, like I used the to spatial do spatial awareness. Yeah. Report. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I, I'm sitting in a, I'm sitting in a, what I would do is I would catch the ball with my back to the basket and I would jump in the air and shoot it. Literally. Like if the basket's there, I would be facing that way in the arena. And then the guy in, would be right there, and he'd throw me the ball right here, and as he's throwing it, I would jump and shoot in there. You start to understand where your, your relationship is to you and the basket. And it, it's a very, like, advanced way to think about shooting because now you're so comfortable with turning left shoulder or turning right shoulder. 
And I'll tell you another thing that's super important because I was telling my son this because we were playing one-on-one the other day and I was on a bad hit, but I was just kind of messing around with him. And every time he would go to shoot the ball, like he had to go from here to up here. And I said, so now when you start to get in evolved shooting, now you have to know how to replace the ball. Because if you got a good defender on you with the ball in front of you, can you bring the ball over here and then get to here? Can you bring the ball from here and then get to here? Because everybody's comfort zone is to come up from right here. So now you got to be able to catch the ball over here and then go right to here real fast. On that shot, if I remember correctly, did you bring it from your left? Um, I, no, I brought it from right here. You brought here. it from left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because but, it, but you, it, it but, came, he, he got it to me like right here and then I came down with it. Okay. You know, so it, it's even like a blur to me because it feels like it happened in slow motion. That play did. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched the ball, even as I think about it now, I watched the ball and it, it, it just kind of, it was like a real movie. It happened in slow motion. And I swear it didn't feel like I did anything with it. It didn't feel like it was going to make it to the rim. Um, it just, it just kind of, as I think about it, just kind of floated right there. And then all of a sudden, it was just like, whoop. And so you didn't feel like when you shot it, because we know, as shooters, we know. We know a perfect shot. We know a shot's going in. Yeah, no. You didn't feel that? Nope. That had no feeling whatsoever. And it, it was just, I can only equate it to just the work that I put in. My body knew. It was like... It was like I was in a position where my body just said, I can, we got this. We got this. We, we've been here. We'll, 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 we'll take over from here. And, you know, it, it was like that one shot. Like as many game winners as I've hit over my career, it seemed like it, you just set up for that one shot. And then that's it. Everything built for that moment. But it, it's, the, it's the worst anxiety you can imagine. Uh, because even even... You know, when you're, it, it got to a point where, the, you know, I'm shooting 90 plus percent from the free throw line too. So now I'm in a position that whenever the game is on the line, it's a two point game. Everybody's like falling the ball towards me. So all this anxiety around shooting, making free throws, being able to come through in the clutch. I was like this, you know, I don't want to be in fortunate for for me and you had a little more to me you know social media is there's such a crux of pressure that kind of comes down on players like when you don't perform well like people are right on your timeline you know right at you you know um and i didn't have to deal with that but you always worried about being able to perform in those situations that's why i was like i just i can't sit and rest thinking this is going to solve itself like I got to be able to push myself and 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 be in these situations. That's why it wasn't about success for me. It wasn't about somebody saying that I was good. It was about me being able to come through in a moment when most people don't want that smoke. And you did, Ray. Thank you. Appreciate this time. You're the best man. Great Appreciate times. Great thank times. You. Yeah. A big thank you to our sponsor, SoFi, the official bank of the NBA. They're the next generation of banking, joining the league to help fans get their money right. I love SoFi checking and savings because you can earn more money on your money, up to 4.6% APY on your savings, which is 10 times the national average savings rate. In just five weeks, the money sitting in your SoFi savings account is earning more money than it would in one year with a big bank savings account with direct deposit. Get paid up to two days early, pay no account fees, and you can cash in on up to $300 when you sign up with direct deposit. Terms apply. Visit SoFi.com slash banking for full details. SoFi is also running the zero giveaway all season long. Each week, one lucky fan will get $10,000. I said it, $10,000 added to their bank account thanks to SoFi. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary to enter or win. Open only to legal U.S. residents 18 and over. Visit SoFi.com slash zero for official rules. This ends June 23rd, 2024. Thank you, SoFi. All right, let's get to the new era draft with Tim Ledley. 
Before we begin, we wanted to give a shout out to New Era, the official cap of the NBA, and now the official headwear of Old Man of the Three. You can support your favorite team by wearing the same caps that the players do or show off your personal style with exclusive drops, shop headwear and apparel, and get 10% off when you go to neweracap.com and use code OLDMAN at checkout. That's 10% off your order using code OLDMAN. Some exclusions apply and visit neweracap.com slash OM3. If you want to see Tommy and my favorites, Tommy, of course, is wearing a beautiful New Era cap. And, and jacket. And jacket. Head to toe. And jacket. I love it. All right, so hold on. I, normally, I let Tommy do the draft. Yeah, talk, but, but there's, one. I want to explain this one. All right. Okay, so we are going to draft. We are going to draft players from the 90s that would thrive in today's NBA. Okay. With the caveat, you have to, if you pick a player, that's how they played in the 90s. So, for, for example, you can pick Larry Bird because he played in the 90s, but mm -hmm. you're not getting prime 84 to 86. Oh, you're getting 92 Larry Bird. Bird? You're getting yes. the year. Okay. okay. Yes. And that you're trying to build a starting five. You're trying to build a legit five man basketball team. Even for a guy like me, who Larry Bird is my favorite athlete of all time, that's a reach for me to take Larry, <laughs> the 92 version Larry's of Larry Bird. That, that's going to be hard. Yeah. Okay. All so right. Okay, I like that caveat. It. So you start. I go second, JJ third. We snake it back. I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna right off the bat. I'm just gonna take it. Obviously, give me Michael Jordan. I'll, I'll go Jordan one. Is that okay? Can we do that? I, I you think to, he I would be you to just fine. He would, he would I last think he would be pick. just fine. There's not gonna. I mean, I can't. There's no banter with that pick. No, there's no there's banter with to that say. Pick. There's nothing to say. It, you, you could By have, the way, even if I went with like Wizards Jordan, it's still pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not. I'm you, going with the Jordan that I played against. Okay, yes, that right. Jordan. All right. Perfect. Okay. Fair. I'm taking Akeem. Oh, taking okay. him. I need him. Wow. Ooh, man, man, that threw me off. That's a great pick. What you? What you? What were you thinking? Thought he was going to be there. There's a good chance I was going to take him with my next second. Yeah. Pick. Okay. Um. All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Shaq. I'm going to go with Shaq. And mm. I feel like. Ah, oh, man. I feel like I can get enough in terms of guard play later. Oh, man. So I'm going to I'm going to go with Scotty. Go with Scott, you're going Scotty 1. No, Shaq. Oh, Shaq. 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 Snake, Shaq. Snake, Snake, Shaq. Snake, Snake draft, Shaq right? So yeah, yeah, 3 yeah. and 4. Yeah, yeah. Then we go back was to there a specific yeah. was there a specific Shaq year or just Shaq overall? Well, he, obviously he he got to the finals with Orlando was a dominant with the Lakers and obviously didn't win a championship till 2000. But in terms of uh, the sort of athletic anomaly that was Shaquille O'Neal, that was the 90s Shaquille O'Neal. You okay. next? Yep. I'm going Reggie. Man. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I think Reggie's Reggie's game. That's he, good. He said he said a couple of years ago. He said he'd average forty five. Um, Interesting. If he played, which maybe might be a little bit of a stretch, but I didn't realize the most threes he ever attempted was six point six per game. Yeah, his career. Reggie. Interesting. Forty five a game. Interesting. Yeah. It's a take. That's Man, a take. this is hard because I got some guys and like the way they played. I could utilize them differently, like different spots, and actually take more advantage of some of their skills than they could even do it in the 90s because of the way that the floor is spread. So that's why this is going to be hard for me. I am going to go... Who the hell is going to draft? I guess you have a keen to counter Shaq. But see, there's there's other centers that like, I could pick that I have to guard it's him. It's the golden era of centers. Yeah, like. I know, but it's like, I don't know. Like the way the game is played now, I don't know that they'd be... Yeah as utilized offensively, right? Well, he see, would. Th this is, this is why, so Shaq, obviously I'm, I, I'm going to draft, I'm going to try to draft a team. Cause I thought you were going to take Shaq. I'm going to try to draft a team. And this is why I pick Scotty second. I need mobile versatile defenders. Cause yeah. Shaq's going to, Shaq's going to play drop coverage. Yep. Right. I'm not getting into a situation like Rudy Gobert in the playoffs where you're, you're like taking him out into space. Right. I, I need, Guys who can cover ground. I feel very confident with my Scotty pick. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. I am going to go. I'm going to put I'm going to put a hell of a defensive team out there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with Grant Hill. Fuck. 
I'm going to go with Grant Hill to counter one. your Scotty Pippen I had, selection. I had that one. So Grant plays a three? Yeah. I, would, I was hoping Grant was going to be my next <laughs> pick, and I was just going to play him at point guard. 96 Grant. Uh, so I got Grant at the three, Jordan at the two, and now I get another pick. I could, I could go shooter or I could go big. All right. I'm going to go Penny Hardaway. Shit. I got. Interesting. Shit. I got great versatility right now going. Penny, Grant Hill, and Jordan. Yeah. It's I'm going to need I'm gonna need a little bit more shooting though. Are you at all concerned about uh, durability? Like long term dur- durability with this team? With what team? The team, team that you're I'm, drafting. That I'm picking? Yeah, of course. Okay. Based on, you know, but you're gonna but, but you're trying to win a championship for yeah. one year. Yeah. I was under the impression we were drafting a team based on like at some point in the nineties, like their peak level. Yeah. Because we can have no, that's that. That's what level, we're doing. That's what right? we're doing. And we're talking about getting through like one series against each other or like yeah. one game against each other. I'm not worried about this. Isn't my team forever going forward? I just I'm I'm wondering where your size is gonna come from. I guess it's coming. It's coming. All right. I'm going um I'm going GP for my third pick. I need a point card. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, all right. I'm I'm gonna get a point guard here too. It looks like we're all getting our point guards with a third pick. I'm th- this guy I actually think would kill in today's NBA game. I really believe that. Tim Hardaway. He's in here. I got him. I got him. Tim Hardaway. He was, he was on my short list. Tim Hardaway. Handle. Yep. Space. Yep. Shooting and I have another finishing. I have another guard in that vein that I don't think is going to get picked, and I don't want to give it away to give you guys an idea. So I'll tell you at the end that I think you guys are both going to go. What do yeah. you think? What do you think about now would make him better? Space, baby. Volume space shooting. Space. Volume shooting. Oh yeah. What's what's his? What was his career high? Around twenty five, twenty six with no, the Warriors. I wouldn't even say that. I would say probably. I would maybe maybe twenty five. I would. Th- I was thinking like twenty three, twenty four. Okay, was where he would he capped out. Yeah. He, he's he, Cause, he's he's high twenties because like Mullen was like twenty five on yeah. those teams. He's, and he's high twenties to low thirties on this team. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The way I'm building this team. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one because he could he could like string together three point shots and now it would be something that would be like he'd be seeking and then the way the floor is spread try keeping that guy ninety one ninety two on the run TMC he averaged twenty three point four twenty three yeah twenty three point four yeah. I like this. I like this. Um, I want a little more shooting. I want a little more shooting. So I, I, I need to. I need shooting. I'm going to go Mitch Richmond, and I think Mitch Richmond hmm. in today's NBA, if he grew up again with the mo- mentality around volume three point shooting, becomes it's like a, he becomes a different tier three point shooter all time. Because that's the thing. That's the thing. Legs. You speak to this man. The mentality around volume three point shooting was much different then. Oh, completely, of course. Yeah. yeah, you didn't process what was you didn't process what was a um, a good shot analytically the way they do yeah, now, yeah. which is yeah. pretty much anything. Yeah, any daylight they were encouraging you to take it. You just didn't. Even though I never felt any coach put restrictions on me to take any shot whenever I wanted, that's not how we thought the game. So to to, to be that free of mind, I, I couldn't imagine what that would feel like. So I'm building my team. I feel like the opposite of legs. I'm going 98, Tim Duncan. It's rookie year. Yeah, first team on NBA. Mm. Wow. That's a good one. I wasn't even thinking of Duncan. Okay. Because he barely snuck in there. So you're going in the 90s. You're going Duncan Hakeem. Yep. Duncan Hakeem, Gary, Reggie. At this point, I'm just gonna say you're you know, Reggie can shoot, but you're gonna have some shooting issues. You're yeah. gonna have some shooting issues. I was worried. I'm worried about the shooting issues, and I'm a little. Duncan's worried, an all-timer. I'm a little worried about the Duncan's the, an all-timer. I'm a little worried at the wing issues too in certain matchups. Okay, but all right. I think that I think I would also provide tough matchups for somebody. Is it me? Wait, can I take my pick back? No. <laughs> Wait. Wait. No. <laughs> have you ever seen that happen no. on draft night? I don't think I've ever <laughs> seen that happen. No way. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take my pick back. I don't. I had this guy. I had this guy, no, I had guy in my draft. top five. No I just way. completely blank for a second. I don't recall that being part of any draft right, ever in anything. Keep going. Keep going. All right. I'm torn here. On I know I need a big, but do I want to? Do I want a versatile big? Okay, or I just want you know your standard big guy that can go bang with Shaq. I think I'd rather have someone that I think I could play at center. Mm. Let's see it. That's freakishly athletic. 
God, Tim's going <laughs> to. Sean Kemp. Oof. Wow. I was thinking that one. Sean Kemp. Wow. And Chris Mullen. 95 Kemp. Those are my two picks. Yeah. Damn. So now I got MJ, Grant Hill, Penny Hardaway, Sean Kemp, Chris Mullen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. JJ's in my head. Because I had a pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he is. I had a pick, but I don't. I think that his note is valid. Um, I'm going to go Glenn Rice. It's my fifth mm. pick. Yeah, I had, I had him God. down. I had him down. I'll add another one, but he can't shoot. So I'm going to, Glenn's going to close it out. Oh, man, that's really disappointing. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find ages here so I can. Like, who do you have so yeah. far? I also want to know who his pick that he wanted to take. Who do you have so far? Back. JJ, who's on your team? Um, yeah, he's just. It's Shaq, just, Scotty, Hardaway, much. Mitch Richmond. Don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't love that collection. <laughs> <laughs> it's not GM. GM JJ is a little shaky. The <laughs> Fuck it. I just I got off to a, I got off to a good start. I felt really confident with my Tim Hardaway selection. I love Mitch Richmond. I would say this is the first time in the history of this draft he's actually tried to pull that. I don't think he's ever tried to do that before. You can get them on get them an undrafted free agent. Can we? You know what we're gonna do? Yeah. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna we're gonna all get to draft a sixth man. Okay. 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 That's fair. And and for the purposes of staying uh, consistent, I get I get to snake this, so I'm going to get okay. three picks here. All right. All right. Or two picks two rather. Picks. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to go Kobe. I know he's young. I know it wasn't the Kobe we all know, but I'm going to go Kobe. Um, feel confident in that. And Would then Kobe come in 97, 96, 97, 96 draft, right? So yeah. 96. So I'm 97. getting year three, Kobe. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to pick Nick Van Exel. Wow. There's the first just absolute outlier pick. <laughs> just dropped. Didn't have didn't have that on my radar at all. I need some scoring. Did not have that on my radar at all. He changed the, the format so he could draft Nick Van X. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's the whole reason you wanted a six man because you wanted to wanted, say I Nick love Van Exel. Nick Van Exel, bro. Loved Nick, yeah, I, I loved you, him. I, I loved him. Okay. Uh, I played against Nick on those Lakers teams, man. All right, so I'm my, uh, my my freshman year, the season ended, and uh, af as soon as the, the as school when school got out, like April whatever twenty fifth or whatever it was, I went out to California. Uh, one of my best friends at Duke uh, lived in Davis, so we spent like a week in Davis, and I was getting ready to fly back, and my uncle lived in Dallas, and he's like, "Do you want to come to the Mavs Kings game? This was playoffs," and I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." So I flew to Dallas. Went to the game. He happened to like know some guy who had courtside seats next next to Ross Perot. So I went down there, and this was when when Nick was uh, with the Mavs, and he hooped that game. And I literally remember thinking to myself, "Fuck, I'm never going to play in the NBA." <laughs> <laughs> like these guys are so because fucking of Van good. Exel's performance. Yeah, like, I'm never yeah, playing the yeah, NBA. Yeah, yeah, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> that's that's a, funny. That's man. an awesome six man. Yeah, that's a great one. All right, I'm closing mine. I gotta take Barkley. Oh yep. my god! I, gotta take, yeah, like, yeah. I need. I mean, that is, he needs that's to get a gross he, oversight. He needs to get picked. Like, he should have been. He should have yeah, been. That's a, in the second round easily. With with, there's, with with playing. Yeah, man. Like, are you saying play? So we playing with the way the game looks now? Yeah. Is that the idea behind it? Oh yeah. yeah. All that space for him. Yeah. I have. I had him written down, but I just kept saying like, like undersized to play against these other bigs that, that these yeah. other teams have. Like that's, that's who yeah, you'd be left with. That maybe he'd be, maybe he's going to be my six man. Akeem God, and Duncan. What the fuck? Just have Barkley come. So you got you Barkley. Have strangest, I have, I have, have Akeem, Reggie, team. Gary Payton, Duncan, Glenn Rice, Barkley. You have a strange team. So I don't know if I go with uh, <laughs> the last big I have written down, the last wing or the last point. I think I got enough wings covered with Grand Hill, Penny, Jordan, I, I got enough wings. Mullen. I got no, I got enough wings. Your team's long. Sean Kemp's even kind of wingish. Yeah. So give me a flat out. I can't imagine how good this guard is, would be in today's game. The way the, the way the league is set up. Give me Kevin Johnson. Yeah. He would be nasty in ball screen offense. He never had to score like huge numbers, but he was capable of it. 
Former teammate, by the way. That's a great pick. It's a good pick. It's a good pick. That was my that was my backup if somebody picked. Jesus, Peyton. Mitch Richmond, by the way. I mean, yeah. I knew he had a high percentage for his career in '96 and '97. Those two seasons, he shot around six threes a game and was at forty three seven and forty two eight. Guys, I just got way more confident in my team. So who I got way Nick more. Was Kobe your? Uh, we'll just, I got. Feel, I got. Was, dude, I got. Was Kobe who you wanted to you wanted to tear the draft up to go back? <laughs> yeah. Well, what was year three Kobe? What were his numbers? Because that's as good as you're going to get, buddy. I know. I know. <laughs> no, he's but I, is but, that again? But, but well, you know I'm what? guessing you want to take it back. Again. No, and no, by no, the no, way, no. by the way, got, by the way, listen, it stops December 31st, 1999. Yeah. So even if he had a great second half of that season, awesome. none of that is eligible for this. I hope, I hope those guys are going to get along for this game. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So in the lockout year, Kobe. Oh, averaged, that's right. Wait a minute now. Kobe averaged twenty a game, uh, five rebounds, three okay. and a half assists, three point eight assists, ninety nine two thousand. So I'm getting a little bit of that guy. Uh, two months of that guy. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting twenty two and a half, six rebounds and five assists a game. Okay. I feel confident in that pick. Okay. Uh, that's great I, great value for the fifth round. Drexler was my other one, but he, he couldn't shoot. I got two guys I want to real quick just mention their names. Tell yeah. me how you think. Dale Ellis? Nope. I thought about him. Yeah. How about Chris Weber? Yeah. Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. Think think about what Rodman's rebounding numbers would look like, like with like the way he would run down, like long rebounds with all those perimeter shots. Pretty good passer. Now, non-scorer, but guard. Mm -hmm. the, the, like, the energy he would expend guarding and, and rebounding for those other four, because all these, everybody we picked is, can score, can fill it up. Yeah. I thought about him as well. Okay. Okay. I'm confident in my team. Mark Price really like was this. another good one I thought oh, about. Oh, Mark Price. That's a good one. That's a good one. I think we got to do this every decade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. It's been great. Sweet, man. You got it. <laughs>